threat is different than most of the threats we face. And, and, and it's a fairly low probability. It's unlikely that this will happen in our lifetimes. But if it does, it could be catastrophic. And so risk depends on both probability and consequences. So it's low probability, high consequences, which means the risk is significant. Um, and, and, and so there's a low probability that we could get hit by an asteroid of the size that could destroy a city or even a nation. And we can't let that happen, even though it's very low probability. The best thing we can do is is surveys, develop a catalog, make sure that we track everything that's big enough um, to do that level of damage and, and to cause that much destruction. And then if we if we discover something that is on a collision, a collision course, we need to make sure it's dis we discover it far enough in advance that we actually can deflect it. And, and we don't really have the technology now. We're in the process of theoretically developing it. And also, there's an experimental test with the DART uh, project that's happening very soon um, that will give us information. But, but honestly, we, we do not have the technology. If we discovered something on a collision course, we would have to be developing the technology at the same time we're designing the mission, which is a difficult thing to do. So, so we also need to be really doing tests like the DART test to make sure that we have confidence that we could actually deflect it or, or disrupt it uh, before impact. Um, if it were a big one, now there is also a risk from small ones, um, like Chelyabinsk, which didn't kill anybody, but sent people to the hospital with injuries, injured something like 1,500 people, mostly with flying glass. Um, so if we can keep that from happening or predict uh, a, an impact or an airburst over a city like that, then we can take measures to either evacuate or shelter or just educate people, stay away from windows and send out an alert, like an air raid type alert that would prevent uh, the number of in injuries that took place. So we're gonna, we're, Basically, it's an impact experiment. It's the same kind of experiment that I did in graduate school, but using cannons and, and, and projectiles like bullets, hitting, hitting rocks and making craters. Um, it's that type of an experiment, but on a planetary scale, a big, much bigger scale. And, and, and so what we will be able to do is measure the amount of momentum transfer from the, the projectile that's hitting this moon, uh, Dimorphos, and, and it will change. And that will give us information about the coupling. So how do you couple uh, energy and momentum, transfer momentum uh, to an asteroid? But it'll be one data point. We, do, we won't know how much we can generalize that. So we'll need to do more experiments and we'll need to do more modeling to really understand before we have confidence that we can sufficiently deflect something that would miss the Earth. So so this is, I think, I hope, just the first of, of a number of experiments. We do run the numbers for risk assessment. It's a probabilistic uh, risk assessment where we do, you know, there's a, a spectrum or a distribution of asteroid sizes. And there, there are not that many big ones, really big ones. There's, there's a few that are on the order of the size of the dinosaur killer, but, and we know about all those, and none of those are in an Earth or a, 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 an orbit that can collide with the Earth. And then when you get down to a one kilometer size, there's something like a thousand of those. We've discovered most of them. Um, there's only a handful of small fraction that are yet to be undiscovered. None of those are an occlusion force. But as you go down the size scale, it, it multiplies and multiplies, and you get down to Tunguska, and there are, I think, 100,000 Tunguska-sized objects. We only have a small fraction of those. 
they're, they're, they're small, so they don't reflect as much light, so they're faint, and so they're harder to discover. Um, so we only have a small fraction of those that have been discovered. So most of those out there are unknown. But another tungus could, could happen at any time. And if it comes from the day sky, from the direction of the sun, we might get no warning at all. Uh, um, and, and I think we need to develop the capability of, of detecting those from the daytime sky, which will require a space-based telescope. Um, so in terms, though, of the, the risk assessment, we can multiply the probability of impact. If we know the number, then we can calculate the probability of impact or the average time between impacts. For example, a Tunguska-sized impact, we think on average happens once every 500 to 1,000 years. So, you know, depending on how you look at it, we were either lucky or unlucky to get one in the recent enough past, um, you know, to have experienced it. And, and from a scientific perspective, it was a lucky thing because we would not have known about it if it had happened a hundred years earlier. There would be no record um, or memory or instruments. You know, we had the seismic instruments, we had uh, barometers, so there, were, and, and we had the tree fall that was mapped. And so we got a lot of information about that event, even though we didn't have you know modern instruments, no satellites, none of the none of the types of instruments we have now. And that actually really helps in our understanding of the amount of damage from an ast a small asteroid and its significance. So remember I said risk is depends on both uh, probability and consequences. Well, that's a much higher probability than a dinosaur killer, but the consequences are much lower. The consequences are, are, are localized and they're not as severe. Um, so we add up all the possibilities of all the types of events that can happen. We sum over the probability of those happening and that's the total risk. So, so that's how we do our risk assessment. That's a good question. Do we know what we don't know? And to some extent, we do. So, so we we know uh, asteroids uh, that are in Earth crossing orbits. They're on fairly small, short period orbits. So they come around and around and around, and eventually they'll come close enough to get in the catalog. But then there are long period comets. So that's what we don't know. We know about them, but we, don't, we know that we don't know about them. And, and the periods are so long, and they spend most of their time so far away from the sun that they don't get in the catalog. So we don't get much warning. If, if something happened to come from far away beyond Jupiter, and it was on a collision course, we wouldn't see it until it was too late. They're really, we don't have a way of preventing that. And people have ideas, untested ideas. You don't want to depend on an untested idea the first time, but it's a difficult idea to test. And in a way, uh, we just, that's a, that's a very low probability event. So even though the consequences are enormous, probability is much, much lower than the probability of anything else. And in a way, we have to depend on the probability being low enough that it's almost certainly not going to happen. And so therefore, we don't add it to the list. We, 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 we as I always tell people, you can minute, you can, you can manage risk, you can minimize risk, but you can't eliminate risk. You can never eliminate risk. But now you have to start comparing the risk of that to other things like supernovas, other things you can't prevent. And there is going to be a background of risk that there's just nothing you can do about. It's just fate. And that, I think, long period comet impacts or extra, you know, interstellar, because there are interstellar objects, you would never see one of those coming. And, and if it was big, it, you know, it could wipe you out. But there's not a lot of evidence that the, the probability is high. And there may be, so you asked again, do we know what we don't know? I guess in a way I can only answer, I mean, so if I, <laughs> there may be, yeah, you can only say may, maybe, yeah. but if we don't know what we don't know, I can't answer the question. <laughs> there, there could be other risks that I have no idea. I can't even conceive. But, the, but, but also we study, you know, we studied the cratering record on other planets. And, and we can count craters 
And there's no evidence from that history because that records what happened in the past. And there's no evidence that there was some extreme event that happened in the past and projecting the past, you know, into the present and future. You know, the flux is pretty stable. So we don't expect that all of a sudden they'll start appearing out of nowhere for reasons that we had never thought of. Um, that's very unlikely. Yeah, so there is a, you know, there's this size distribution of asteroids. And, and your question is really, what's the difference between a direct hit, meaning a crater forming impact, and an airburst? And, and so something the size of the Tunguska impactor, if it's made of iron, it will punch a hole through the atmosphere. It'll lose some of its energy to the atmosphere. It'll slow it down a little bit. Maybe pieces will break off but it will hit the ground at a high enough speed that it'll penetrate the surface and explode underground and blow out an enormous crater. And Meteor Crater is a perfect example of that in Arizona, also called Beringer Crater. Um, and it's more than a kilometer in diameter. Um, and the, the size of the asteroid or the mass of the asteroid was probably very similar to the Tunguska asteroid. The Tunguska asteroid was probably weaker it was lower density, it came in at a shallower angle, so it lost all its energy and exploded at high altitude. That was an airburst. So the question is, which is worse? And, and the answer really is, it depends on where you are. If you're at ground zero, uh, it's worse to be at meteor crater because you're in the, you're, you're hit, hit, get a direct hit or you're in the crater zone and, you know, that's unsurvivable. Tunguska, it's probably worse if you're at some distance because it exploded at a high altitude and the shockwave propagation from a high altitude is more direct. And so there's a much stronger blast wave at a given different uh, distance. So, so, so it, you know, the risk, the risk assessment, you know, in a way depends on how the population is distributed. And, you know, if I lived in a city and somebody said, would you rather have a uh, direct impact or a Tunguska impact overhead, I'd say Tunguska impact, I'd be more likely to survive it if I went down in the basement or in the subway or something. But if I was at a distance and I, and it's like if, if, if uh, something hit 20 kilometers away, would you rather have it be Tunguska or Meteor Crater? Then I'd probably say Meteor Crater um, because then, you know, the shockwave would, would, would be weaker. Um, there may be debris like ejecta, but again, if I go down in the basement, that may be more survivable. So it, it, the answer is it depends. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, <Within> decades. <laughs> to me, that's a no-brainer prediction. It's just simple probability. So why? Like, because there are so many more Chelyabinsk, there's a million objects the size of Chelyabinsk, the, the one that, that exploded over Chelyabinsk. And there are far fewer objects that are big enough to form craters. So if you ask me, what is the next one? It's, you know, 99 out of 100 times, it's going to be another airburst. So if I, if I make that prediction over and over and over, you know, it's it's like making the sure bet every, every time. And once in a while, you know, if it's not a certainty, once in a while you'll lose the bet. You'll, you'll make a wrong prediction. But that, you know, I'm only going to live so long. And even Chelyabinsk is once every 50 years. So, you know, I'll be lucky to live to see another Chelyabinsk size. And I'm virtually certain I won't live long enough to see a large crater forming impact on Earth. I could be wrong, It's, it's but it's very low probability. And so, so betting is all about probability. <laughs> so airbursts like Chile Bisk, you said, uh, happen approximately once every 50 years. That's like the period. Okay. Well, it's not a period. Yeah. And I, and, yeah. and, and I sometimes forget to explain that, you know, on average, it's once every 50 years, but you could have one, one year and one the next year, but over the long haul, you know, what is the mm -hmm. average number of years between impacts over the long haul? It, we think it's about 50 years. Um, so you might go a hundred years for the next one, or you might go two years, but on average, uh, the, the 
the, the interval between impacts is 50 years. Telescopes are the most important thing, and telescope, telescopes have other value. Um, and there's other value in detecting asteroids because they're also resources, potential resources for mining. So discovering asteroids for other purposes, there's always spin-off applications, just like, you know, the manned space program, the Apollo program. You know, there were spin-off, you know, technology uh, benefits for, for going to the moon. And, and, and in, a, in a way, I think the, the benefits of detecting and finding uh, asteroids uh, are even greater. And the, the return on the investment is greater. And there are other uh, ideas. For example, what I'm going to mention tomorrow in my presentation is the idea of, of uh, adventure tourism associated with finding small chai events or smaller uh, objects in advance. And then if you find them far enough in advance, you can take people to watch it and you can fly people at a safe distance. You could have charter flights. People go see solar eclipses. They go see, you know, northern lights, uh, all sorts of phenomena, volcano eruptions. There are, there's a certain type of tourism and it's kind of like an entry level space tourism. It's people, most people are never going to be able to afford to go up in Virgin Galactic or Blue Origin. It's just out of, it's, you have to be wealthy. You have to be very rich to have that kind of income to do something like that. A charter flight is within reach for some people and, you know, piggybacked on that can be scientific instruments. And so understanding, you know, being able to record what happens when an object that you observed in space enters the atmosphere, how it fragments, how it breaks up, how it ablates, how the shock wave forms, how meteorites drop onto the ground. Finding the meteorites are valuable themselves. So if you find them, you can immediately pick up the meteorites if, it, if it's over land. So there's value to meteorites. So it, it delivers its own resource. So there are potential businesses and financial interests that would be interested in doing this. But like a lot of things, you need to start with some kind of government funding um, and then business opportunities will emerge. Because of all these side benefits, there may be a reason. For example, a business could emerge. It's like we're going to we're going to buy our own survey telescopes. We're going to detect asteroids, and then we're going to identify asteroids that may be easy to get to and may have resources, and it may be even proprietary information. They may not share that, but you know they may say, "Well, if we happen to find one that's a risk that on a collision course, well, then we'll make that public." Um, but I could imagine that a company, just like uh, mineral exploration, they send geologists out in the field and they're not doing research to share with the public. They're de doing research for their own benefit, but oftentimes scientifically useful information comes out of it. And a great example of that is the Chicxulub crater. You know, that the information the, the, you know, the, the survey that found that crater was used for ex oil exploration. And then it kind of leaked into the scientific community. It's like, wait a minute. There's a huge crater there. It's got the age and is consistent with the one that was, uh, you know, at the time, just a really just a theory that there was a big impact at the time that wiped out the dinosaurs. Well, that kind of clinched. That was the sort of the smoking gun proof that there really was an impact at that time. Um, that wiped out the dinosaurs. So, so you know, there is sort of this balance between, you know, uh, uh, personal interest or corporate interest and public interest. And when you can overlap those two interests, it can be beneficial to both. Yeah, so, so I'm not an expert on asteroid mining, but I have ideas. And, and I think most of the value of an asteroid, if you can capture an asteroid or some mass of the asteroid, I mean, one thing, if you're building structures in space or if you're going to, my, to Mars, you need certain resources that involve mass for radiation shielding, um, for construction, um, water. Um, so, you know, these may be the resources because it's 
it, it is very expensive to send material to space, but asteroids are already in space. And if you can cleverly, you know, capture them, and put them in orbits where they would be useful and, and, and take pieces of them for for use in space where you need mass. There are certain, certain uses of mass in space, you know, shielding, debris shielding, all sorts of, of reasons. In some ways, I think, you know, in my opinion, that may be the, the most useful purpose of mining. And then some of it I would compare more to quarrying than mining um, because you're taking chunks for use, possibly. I, I think every field of science has pseudoscience associated with it, and people who take ideas from science and then they either misinterpret them or misrepresent them or, you know, misunderstand them or some combination. And, and I think all of those apply, in fact, maybe particularly apply to the threat from asteroids. And I, I see clickbait headlines virtually every day. Asteroid headed for collision course with Earth, NASA issues warning. And they're never true. Um, if you wouldn't see it, you know, in a unknown uh, a newspaper or a blog that you've never heard of or, or, or a tabloid only you, you you would see them in the mainstream press and it would be a top headline if it really was a risk to the earth it would be a big enough story that it would dominate the news so you know i encourage people not to click on the clickbait because it's for selling it's for getting people to go to the website and selling products so that's one form is just misusing it as quite great. Um, there's other uh, people write books about how some archaeological site was destroyed by an impact. And, you know, that sells because, you know, it, 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 in a way to, to certain people, I think asteroid airbursts and impacts are like UFOs. It's just another form of an alien. And, you know, it affected ancient Egypt or some some biblical city um, was destroyed by an asteroid, and that, that's sort of more of a. I mean, it, it goes. Some of this has even gotten into the ac academic literature, and it's a kind of a form of academic clickbait. And then there's this whole circuit of people who buy write books with with interesting but wrong archaeological ideas and, and that's very popular and they sell a lot of books so they make money there's there's money to be made on that